Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Rustam Shah Live. Again with me, my friend and co-host Ray, the producer from the USA. And my guest today is Mr. Talmiz Ahmed, who is a former Indian diplomat and ambassador to Saudi Arabia, twice, Oman and UAE, and spent a lot of time there. Uh, he has published also four books, and uh, his recent book, uh, the West Asia at War, Repression, Resistance, and Great Force Games, just published in 2022, I think in February 2020. Uh, he writes and lectures frequently on the politics of West Asia, political Islam, and energy security issues. Uh, Mr. Ahmed, first of all, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by saying and asking, the Middle East is a complex and a fascinating region that has, uh, you know, undergone tremendous changes over the 50 years, if you if you will. Uh, the countries of Middle East are generally either republic or monarchies. Uh, the republics tend to be secular, you know, while the monarchies are often religious. Uh, the political system in the region are generally unstable. Uh, there have been some recent protests and uprising in some countries. Now, you have spent quite a lot of time there, and we would like to know how do you describe these countries and their governments, sir? The, all the governments in uh, West Asia and North Africa, uh, referred to roughly as the Arab world, uh, they are authoritarian regimes. There are two, two kinds. Some of them are republics. Some of them are monarchies. But they are authoritarian regimes. So that is the first point to be noted. The second is that they have a kind of social contract with their people. They will provide the people with security and welfare, and in return, they will exercise monopoly control over decisions relating to national interest and foreign policy. The third point to be noted is that the interests of the ruling regime and the interests of the national, of the country as a whole, are conflated. There is no distinction made between one or the other. And uh, as a result, you find that many of the monarchies, for example, depend crucially for their security on the Western powers, particularly the United States. And the United States is not required to make any distinction between the country's security and the security of the ruling regime. So the security of the ruling regime is uh, is identical to or conflated with uh, the country's interest. So the United States is committed to maintaining the political status quo as far as the monarchies are concerned. The United States has a very deep interest in the region because the region is oil rich. Uh, even if the United States may not purchase too much oil from the region, the American allies do. Uh, both in the case of uh, you know, Europe as well as uh, Japan and Korea. So there is a very important element relating to energy, uh, which motivates the American presence and the American national interest in the region. America, the United States also has associated itself with maintaining the status, uh, the security of Israel. So very often you will find that Israel's security well, actually, many objective observers like myself would suggest that Israel doesn't need anybody's support now for its security. It's fully capable of looking after itself. But the United States is now very deeply engaged uh, with Israel. At the same time, the United States has very deep-seated animosity for Iran. So you have a very emotional character to the American relationship with the region total support for its allies, and total animosity as far as the uh, uh, hostile elements, hostile governments and hostile powers are concerned. This is an overview of the region. Okay, uh, we will come back to this U.S. Uh, role in the region very soon, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, but let's talk about the uh, India and India has always been a key player in the region. At least we see this uh, uh, both politically and economically. And in recent years, the relationship between India and the Middle East has become even stronger. And, uh, with the two regions working closely together on a number of issues, 
what do you think that key uh, Indian Gulf diplomacy principles? See, India has had a very complex relationship with the region. We have a historical connection that goes to the period of Hirappa and Mohenjo-Daro and Indian maritime connectivity across the Indian Ocean, particularly the Arabian Sea, goes back to historic times as well. So there is a very high level of give and take between the peoples of India, particularly Peninsular India, and Gujarat, and Kutch, and Sindh, and the peoples of the uh, Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula. At the, uh, but this was, a, a, you could say this was a people-to-people -people connection, a, a mercantile connection, a, a, a intellectual and religious connection, and therefore there is a very high level of cultural comfort and a shared sense of ethos as far as the two peoples are concerned. Where the British came in, initially it was the imperial powers that intervened in the Indian Ocean affairs, and later on the Indian Ocean came to be dominated by the British, the British brought to the relationship a strategic and political element as well. So the earlier people-to-people, -people, commercial and intellectual connectivity now got a very strong political and strategic value because the British felt the need to dominate the region as it was the pathway to India, which was viewed as the jewel in the crown. And then this political relationship also impacted on India because this domination of the Gulf was not from London, but from India, from British India. So it is British India that provided the funds, the personnel, the, the institutions, and all the support that this region needed in order to sustain British interests. After independence, you find that India went back to its earlier relationship and gave up on the political and strategic factor. There was the Cold War divide as well, where India tended to support the republics as against the monarchies that were part of the Western alliance, and hence the political element in the relationship as far as Gulf countries was concerned was zero. The part of the West, therefore, you find Pakistan playing a more substantial role as far as the political and defense relationship is concerned. But India from the 1980s onwards started building up a community-based relationship, uh, perhaps building on the old uh, cultural comfort and old cultural relationships. We started having a community-based relationship. Then from the 1990s, we started importing a lot of energy from here as our growth rates went up, and we have built up a very substantial trade relationship. That has become an investment-related relationship as well. About 10 years ago, uh, uh, when, during the visit of Dr. Manmohan Singh to Riyadh in uh, 2010, February 2010, our relationship obtained a very substantial security element, and that is counter-terrorism. That after the attack on Mumbai, uh, uh, from forces uh, present in Pakistan, there was a shared recognition both in India and the countries of the Gulf that they had a common threat, a common threat from extremist Islam that emanated from Pakistan. As India's political and uh, uh, strategic ties have expanded, it is not as if the relation, this is a zero-sum scenario. Pakistan continues to maintain its traditional relationship uh, with the region. It has a defense relationship which continues. But as I keep on emphasizing, India has its own value as far as the region is concerned. Pakistan brings its own traditional value and the two don't contradict each other. Uh, the, the region recognizes that India's significant importance is with regard to the economic component and the counter-terrorism component. And where Pakistan is concerned, it is still anchored in a defense component. Uh, yes, sir. And we see this also. Um, I mean, there are so many expats living in, uh, in Gulf countries. Uh, I think the highest numbers of expats are actually from India. And 
in Pakistan, usually they think because these countries are Muslim, so they prefer, you know, Muslim from uh, Pakistan, Yemen, and other. It's other way around. Uh, because I heard you saying earlier, uh, I, I'm sorry, I forgot which show you were on, that uh, at least in Saudi Arabia, in context of Saudi Arabia, was it, I guess, that they don't like uh, Muslims uh, from Pakistan and Yemen because they tend to interfere in their internal politics more than the Indian, for example. Was that your uh, observation when you were uh, a diplomat? I explain this more clearly. Yes, please. Uh, Firstly, let me make it very, very clear to your listeners that as far as the Gulf is concerned, the fate of the person recruited is not relevant to them. So that should be put aside. So anybody who says, oh, I'm a Muslim and therefore I should be working in the region is completely misguided and has no understanding of the region. What does the region want? It wants qualified people. It wants people who are disciplined. Who, are, who obey the local laws and who provide the services for which they are contracted. And I think that is why you have a very large, now what, a very large number of Indians. My own personal speculation was that in the 1980s, even as the Gulf countries encouraged the global jihad in Afghanistan, and you had countries from the Islamic world, including from Yemen and Egypt and Pakistan and many other Arab countries participating in it, Indians did not. Not a single Indian Muslim joined the global jihad and has not joined the global jihad uh, up to now. So you find, my own sense was, the reason for preferring Indians, not, uh, not choosing between Hindus or Muslims or anything, the religion was not important, the fact that these people are not involved with local politics is the crucial factor. So the in, what the Indians brought to the table was the fact that they are apolitical as far as the region is concerned and at the same time they are competent, they are disciplined, they are qualified, they don't interfere in local politics. So this is the factor that encouraged. Now there was a concern because as you know Many of these countries were involved with the global jihad that the Gulf itself had sponsored. So there's an irony here that the Gulf countries were happy to sponsor jihad in Afghanistan, but not willing to get the jihadis participating in it in their own country. Yeah, that was my. From that. Yeah, uh, that was my uh, other question. You just read my mind because we know that in 80s uh, they supported with the help, with the help of Afghanis, uh, USA and Pakistan, uh, a global jihad in Afghanistan, and then we all know what happened afterwards. Uh, okay, but coming back to the uh, region itself, so, but recently we saw there were some uh, issues uh, in Indian, uh, in India where, you know, some religious incident happened and very sharp criticism came from some Gulf countries like Qatar and uh, so we, we were wondering if, if, if uh, there was some kind of a change or you think that was just like, you know, to uh, play the politics. Is a change. As far as the Gulf countries leaders are concerned, they don't have they don't have any interest in the domestic affairs of other countries. They have because, as you know, they themselves are vulnerable as far as their own record is concerned. So the last thing they want to do is to make comments on what is happening elsewhere. We had two issues. One was in 2020 when there was a certain degree of communalization of the pandemic and there was a certain uh, uh, social media activity that tended to demonize Muslims. Some elements of this social media reached the Gulf. Rather than comment on the social media activity that was hostile to Muslims as a community, uh, no government made any statement at that time but they encouraged private individuals and sections of civil society to contribute, to make comments. And I think that very quickly was uh, ended because Prime Minister Modi came publicly and said India belongs to all communities, etc. So it was diffused. The second matter that came up, and which is what you are referring to now, is that in a certain television debate, certain 
uh, a certain BJP spokesperson got a little carried away with her rhetoric and made some loose remarks about the prophet and his family. Now, I am not sure the lady concerned has any knowledge of either history or politics or scripture, religion or what have you. There is, I felt that they, she just thought that this is a way to score points on television and get five minutes of fame. And this is where it would have normally rested. It took 10 days for Gulf countries to finally say something publicly. Why did this happen? It is because it pertains to the Prophet, to the Holy Prophet. That while the Gulf countries were happy to not involve themselves with other domestic issues agitating India, they could not ignore and they were not allowed to ignore the, the negative references to the Holy Prophet and his family. So they were, uh, they, what happened as I recall is that the sections of the social media started uh, conveying to religious authorities in the Gulf uh, what had been said on television. And as you know, there is a red line as far as the Holy Prophet is concerned. And that is why the governments in the countries concerned had no choice but to be seen to be doing something. And they quickly got their act together and made certain angry remarks, some on the ambassador, etc. And very quickly allowed it to wither away. As after that, the Prime Minister visited the UAE, he was very well received. And I think the signal went from both sides that our entire effort is to put this unpleasant episode behind us. Indians remain apolitical. But I sounded in an alarm bell at that time. I said that the preference for Indians in terms of recruitment in the region is because we are apolitical. Decisions relating to recruitment are not done by governments. They are done by private individuals who own companies. And we therefore need to be sensitive in this regard. We do depend on the recruitment of our people in the Gulf. We have eight and a half million people living there. Each person in the Gulf supports at least four people at home. So 40 to 50 million people directly depend uh, on, uh, recru on working in the Gulf. The last thing you need is for uh, uh, companies to become concerned, con companies to become wary in terms of recruiting Indians. And I think that message went quite strongly because regardless of what your political views might be, the hmm. last thing any government in Delhi is going to do is to jeopardize the presence of Indians in the Gulf. So I think oh. that matter also has been well understood and I think it has been diffused. Uh, for now, and I think we are back to square one. Uh, Indians continue to be the preferred community in the region. We are the number one community in every country of the Gulf, and in three countries, we are in fact the majority community. In UAE, Bahrain, and Qatar, Indians are the majority community. Also, I must point out to you that the recruitment is of Indians. Nobody in the Gulf has ever expressed a certain preference for one community over the other. And I think that pattern has continued. Uh, very well put it. Uh, Ray, did you have any comment or question in between? Yeah, I, I actually did. Um, well, from what you've uh, told us, uh, Mr. Ahmed, it does seem like the Gulf states or the Arab countries are dictating Indian domestic policy. And some of the things that you mentioned you know, the red line and the, the so-called blasphemy and, you know, all of these things. Um, first of all, I don't think there should be any blasphemy laws. I think 295 is an affront to a secular India. And we can talk about, you know, some other areas, uh, you know, as we uh, progress. But I, I did want to sort of ask you, why is it that without getting into you know religion and without getting into uh the details uh first of all what uh, you know was it what was said that was offensive or who said it that was offensive because what was said uh was actually in the hadith you know the age of aisha six and nine when the marriage was consummated 
So this is a this is a I, I understand this is a sensitive issue for Muslims, but you know we've we've had certain incidents uh, take place in its wake. You know Salman Rushdie got stabbed, and then we have uh, we had these two men murder a, a an Indian tailor, Kanayalal, and that was to protest what was said by this BG, BJP spokesperson who on the record I've actually called out as an idiot and I have no you know hesitation in say that she's a, she's an idiot because as a um, spokesperson for for a major political party for the party that's in power you do not say things that will incense or or uh, you know offend or I actually believe in offending I believe in free speech but it is uh, that's her job. She's a spokesperson. So you cannot be seen uh, as someone that's endorsing an anti, you know, like a like an anti-minority or an anti-Muslim view. So I completely understand that that was an idiotic thing. She got carried away. I, I think she, it was a dumb thing to say. But my question is, what you know, she was ostracized. She was uh, she was fired. You had the Supreme Court actually issuing like singling her out, which. I mean, not, you know, apples and oranges, the U.S. is completely different, but you wouldn't, won't have the U.S. Supreme Court act in such a manner. So my question is, uh, was it what was said that was offensive or was it who said it, a Hindu nationalist or, a, you know, a, which was the problem? And to what extent uh, is this a one-time thing? Uh, and to what extent do the Arab states... Or, or are the Arab states allowed to meddle in Indian domestic policy? Thank you. See, all matters relating to the Holy Prophet and his family are matters of very deep sensitivity as far as the Muslim community in general is concerned. My own view is very clear in this regard. That unless you are a scholar of scripture and religion, it is far better for us to leave scripture to the scholar. I am a student of history and politics, but not of scripture. Now, very often I have had people reply to my interview on the subject and said, Oh, but it is written in the Hadith. People who do have never read a Hadith in their life, people don't even know what is a Hadith are quoting hadith to me you can go to the internet and pick up three lines from somewhere and say muslim uh, islam advocates violence and war and this kind of nonsense i believe leave scripture to the scholar and let us discuss the political aspect also wherever faith is concerned there is a requirement that we show respect for the faith of other people it is not for me to pass judgment or to uh, make certain uh, remarks of a pejorative character on the basis of extremely superficial knowledge. I am not a scholar of faith, either of Islam or of Hinduism or of Christianity. I don't involve myself in matters relating to scripture. And therefore, I believe I, whatever may be the faith and belief system of my interlocutor, I respect that. We are here to discuss politics. I am happy to discuss politics on any subject. Therefore, when the issue came up about disparaging remarks about the Holy Prophet and Hazrat Aisha and what her age was, etc., there are views of other scholars who say that this hadith, which is uh, mentioned so frequently, is a weak hadith. Now, very few people outside scholarship know what is a weak hadith, what is a scholar, authentic hadith, etc. Hadith itself is an extremely complex subject. There is no consensus among scholars on this on with regard to hadith. There are numerous collections of hadith. There are fundamental differences between Sunni and Shia tradition as far as the authenticity of certain hadith is concerned. So I personally feel leave scripture out and let us agree to respect each other mutually. Okay. All of us are uh, men of uh, men and women of faith. Let's get on with that. That discussion okay. on Indian television, 
were got very polemical because sections of the Indian television encourage these kind of so-called debate and you know polemical name calling etc. They get their numbers from that. And most people who watch all this don't watch it for news or information. They watch it as entertainment. So this is what happens. And uh, most people like us who are very serious people hardly waste any time on this. So it is not a question of who said what. It was a question of a reference, a negative and pejorative refer reference to the Holy Prophet and his family by someone who has no knowledge of Islam or of religion in general or of any scripture whatsoever. A loose remark in the midst of a certain polemical discussion. And that is what we have to be concerned about. That yes, you have right to have differences with each other. You have a right to have a certain position and point of view. But it has to be based on mutual respect and within the framework of the law. And that is what I would espouse. And that is what uh, I would uphold. Uh, okay. Um, <coughs> um, so, so just uh, going back to this uh, question that these states, the Arab states, uh, you know, uh, angrily responded. But uh, if I understood you correctly, that was more a political uh, a gesture. Uh, they don't get offended that easily. They don't, you know, use Islam uh, because they are Muslims. They use Islam perhaps to just to remain in power, if, if I uh, understood you correctly. I think, Rustam, I think we should stick to politics because, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think it's fair. We, we're moving into uh, okay. religion right. exclusively. But, uh, but Mr. Ahmed, I did want to ask you, uh, sort of, you know, my, when, I, when I read uh, about politics in India, uh, uh, I see that, that, you know, there's this overuse of this, this blasphemy law. Everyone's filing, you know, these FIRs. And I know you talked about you know, hurt feelings. And that's precisely what that law is. It says, you know, if you, if you hurt the feelings of so-called religious sentiment, let me just, you know, be very clear. My uh, personal position is that people should be allowed to, to hurt other people's feelings because feelings are feelings, you know, there, it's not, it's not a thing. And, and of course, laws should not be based on feelings. Laws should be fi uh, based on objective, you know, facts. So it, I see this every day, or well, not every day, but very frequently. There's, a, there's, you know, either either Hindus are offended or Muslims are offended, and you know, so I, it just sometimes it makes me feel like, you know, maybe if we didn't have these kind of laws, and people were just able to, you know, express themselves, and we would all get over it like we are in the U.S. or in Europe, for example. Nobody gets wound up if someone's, you know, makes a joke about about Jesus, for example. But my question remains that to me, it does seem like the the Indian government allowed the Gulf states to sort of dictate their, their you know, who they hire and who they fire. So that's, that's the question that I wanted to sort of focus on. Thank you. No, what is the question? The question is, do you think that, that in this case, the Gulf states were able to sort of, uh, influence the government to fire someone or you know to to remove someone uh, from 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 their position I'm not sure what exactly you are referring to uh, in India we have a constitution a rule of law and a certain system that enforces it I'm not sure that the system always works as well as it should there are extraordinary pressures that are, born, uh, that are brought to bear upon certain people in a set of circumstances, particularly the security forces. And uh, the overall scenario sometimes is less than satisfactory. India is a society that is in a churn today. And there are very powerful forces in play seeking to anchor their political advantage on the basis of a certain extreme and political posture uh, at the expense of moderation. What is happening in India to some extent or to a considerable extent actually reflects what is happening in many parts of the world. 
you see very extreme polarization in terms of political posture and political opinion in the United States, for instance, where you are located at present. You see this in very large parts of Western Europe as well. In fact, there is a major questioning of some of the fundamental values that were ascribed to the Enlightenment earlier. So yes, there seems to be a certain degree of global churn, a churn globally, and increased polarization, increased intolerance, uh, and uh, non-accommodativeness, non-moderate approach, etc. And, and this is something that we are all going through, we are all experiencing. Today, we, it's almost impossible to discuss American politics objectively because of the very high degree of passion that is now involved. What we, it's an ideal scenario, which I don't think has ever really existed, where you could discuss issues dispassionately. We would like to, we would like to believe that we are moderate and sensible people, but very often we do allow passions to rule the debate. And that happens quite frequently, and it is uh, not something that we can always appreciate or understand or like, but at, we cannot uh, pretend that it doesn't happen. India is part of this churn. It is an ongoing uh, process. It is not something that one can always be satisfied about or proud of, but it is also part of a much larger phenomenon of large sections of domestic opinion being dissatisfied with a certain set of uh, arrangements in the political order and wanting to change it to their own short-term benefit and advantage. Okay, uh, uh, you were a diplomat uh, f almost like more than half of your life, I think. Uh, you spent like 30, 30 plus years there. Uh, before I go to this U.S. part, uh, I want to know your opinion about some people may say that international diplomacy should be based on uh, moral principles, uh, while others may believe that it should be based on pragmatism. As a career diplomat, what is your opinion about it, sir? See, one doesn't cancel out the other. The simplest way of looking at diplomacy is to say that diplomat pursues, defines, and then pursues the national interest. The question then arises is, what is the national interest? The national interest, the understanding of national interest is not cast in stone. It is uh, constantly changing. It is changing due to the set of circumstances in which we are functioning, the kind of leadership that has emerged, the kind of leadership that you are dealing with as your interlocutor, so it's a very, very mutating and dynamic scenario within which we function. None of us would ever say that we don't believe in moral principles. In fact, many of our positions are articulated broadly in moral terminology. But at the same time, we also know that in the pursuit of the national interest, sometimes certain actions are taken which might not be perfect in terms of a moral code. Uh, I think that countries do their best to strive to achieve what they wish to achieve in the best possible way without violating norms and rules. Uh, I think that most countries do do that. Having said this, I am very uncomfortable when a certain leader or a certain country emerges and believes itself to be uniquely exceptional to say that we are upholders of a certain kind of moral values and that we are therefore superior to someone else. I find that uncomfortable and frankly unacceptable. Some of the loudest votaries of morality in politics are the greatest violators of morality and some of and are the world's greatest hypocrites as well. And therefore I would say the less you talk about morality, what we should be talking about are principles. What are the principles that motivate us? What are the principles? How do I flesh out my concept of national interest? On the basis of which principles? And many times those principles are unimpeachable. 
you can go forward into the international community and say, these are my principles. I don't need to talk about moral values, but I can assert principles of a certain kind and character. And I can say, look, these are my principles. These are my red lines. And I think you would be comfortable with that because I'm going to respect your principles and your red lines as well. The moment I assert principles in my favor, but do not respect the red lines of the other, I have the potential for conflict. And that is what we have to avoid. At the end of the day, the role of the diplomat is to manage relations. I can't always resolve fundamental issues, but I can manage relations. I can ensure that a difference of opinion, a difference of perception, a difference even of national interest doesn't mutate into conflict. Because I believe that the moment you have conflict, you have defeated diplomacy. And I think that's what we do. We, hmm. at the end of the day, what do we do? We manage relations in order to ensure that we are able to, uh, to avoid confrontation and conflict. And I would therefore advise my government at all times that, look, if you are so sensitive on this particular subject, you have to also understand that they are also sensitive on this subject. Therefore, let us understand each other pure, uh, well and we can get on with each other. If you do not, if you assert only your own interest and point of view and totally ignore the sensitivities of someone else, you have the potential for deep differences that could mutate into conflict. Okay. Uh, you are very critical of uh, US government. Uh, I think you wrote a whole chapter on President Biden. Uh, you call him uh, childish, uh, a disaster zone. Uh, these are very you know, harsh, I would say, or strong words uh, coming out from a diplomat. Usually uh, we see diplomats are very uh, mild and polite when they are- Diplomatic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> diplomatic. But, uh, uh, you are very critical of his his uh, government's response, especially in Afghanistan. Uh, can you uh, describe us uh, the reason uh, of your criticism, uh, especially on the U.S. government role in Afghanistan and or leaving Afghanistan? Because see, it seems I that to be a practicing diplomat in 2011, and from that day till today, I am a private citizen. And I have made myself an academic and I confine my commentary to scholarship. I am I'm, I'm a scholar. I believe in scholarship. Scholarship requires you to study a topic in considerable detail, familiarize yourself with the entire literature, then put across your, the various things that have happened, what one side said, what the other said, and then put across your own opinion. Since I'm no longer a practicing diplomat, I have the license, a license that I assert with great enthusiasm, the license to be very objective and at the same time very critical. Now, with regard to issues that have agitated me are the ones that the United States has been most actively involved in, in over the last 30 years. And that is the, the war on Iraq in 1991 and the aftermath of that war, the, do, the sanctions inspections regime, the no-fly zones, the dual containment, etc., which damaged Iraq very seriously, killed a very large number of people, indeed half a million children were denied food and medicine entirely on account of sanctions that the United States had imposed upon them. And when Secretary of State Madeleine Albright was asked some years later whether the death of half a million Iraqis was a price worth paying uh, for the debilitation of the Iraqi regime, she said on television that it was a price worth paying. Debilitation of the Saddam regime, not its overthrow, that happened in 2003. In the 1990s, uh, the price of putting to death Half a million Iraqis was deemed adequate and appropriate by the American Secretary of State. 
now that is something that i am quite happy to come forward and condemn with the harshest possible language two other issues that occurred with regard to the american response to the attack of 9/11 and the attack upon iraq in 2003 now the attack on 9/11 for the president history began on that day but all of us know that those who attacked iraq uh, attacked the united states had been nurtured by the americans in afghanistan the global jihad was an american enterprise funded by the americans armed by the americans and supported by saudi arabia and pakistan americans hardly seem to know that for them there is something inherently wrong with islam or with arabs who dare to attack the united states because we love freedom now this is nonsense and uh, what i have pointed out in my book uh, i have pointed out that the decisions relating to shaping of the global war on terror was done in anger and the moment decisions are taken in anger motivated by revenge then you are going to make mistakes the united states never considered even for 5 minutes that there was this problem of 911 can what is the cause what was it did could we have done something differently is the massive assault upon afghanistan and killing of 30 or 40000 people the adequate the correct answer and then when the americans started occupying afghanistan you find at no stage in the 20 year period were the americans ever clear why they are there what is it that has to happen for the americans to declare victory and move on they never did so it became a democracy project and the moment you have a democracy project you have to be very deeply involved with the culture the history the society which you want to transform for the better at no stage in 20 years did the americans know anything about afghanistan that is my criticism coming to iraq nobody has ever given a coherent or cogent argument as to why the united states attacked iraq in 2003 iraq was not involved with al qaeda it was not involved with 9/11 it was already a debilitated state due to 12 years of american sanctions why was it necessary to attack iraq and then create the problems that we had all those years later i am a critic of what that happened so there are serious decisions taken by the american president with no serious application of the mind i personally feel that every time you respond to a challenge you should have complete clarity what is the cause of that problem what is the likely solution what are the resources that you should garner for that what are the financial resources the technological resources the diplomatic resources and the military resources that you should put together what is the time frame within which you should uh, be able to accomplish your mission okay and who are the allies you will put together i have never seen evidence of any of this happening well, well i i can i do i am a critic okay well, let me argue that the us can simply <coughs> say well, we were protecting our interests uh, just like uh, <coughs> any government or any other country will say that well, we were protecting because we were attacked and we had to make sure that, uh, uh, that nobody else you know use this particular area uh and then attack again on us okay we can argue that the uh, usa was protecting its uh interest now uh unfortunately we don't have much time we set on one hour so i may have to skip one or two questions uh, i want to ask you uh, uh let's move on uh to indian relationship with the usa uh recently uh i had this impression that you were a bit critical of india joining quad and leaving the regional you know uh, associations behind and uh, was there any particular issue with that because uh, it seems that although you may be critical to us uh, government and their policies but the indian government thinks otherwise they think they have uh, their interests are better served if they are allied 
uh, aligned with the US, uh, USA uh, rather than you going against uh, all uh, stay uh, with the Russian and Chinese uh, or regional powers. Uh, what is your opinion on this? Let me clarify matters to you. India espouses strategic autonomy. Strategic autonomy is the post-Cold War terminology that we use as against non-alignment which made sense during the Cold War. So we are, we exercise strategic autonomy. Strategic autonomy means building up relationships, giving substance to those relationships and having alignments which will subserve our interest. It does not mean a passive diplomacy. It means an extremely active diplomacy. For us, as the asymmetry in comprehensive national power between India and China increased, there was a sex, sex sense among certain sections of the Indian security establishment, as I see it, that India's interests would be better served if we were to get closer to the Americans. So that um, the alignment with the United States would provide a degree of balance as far as the asymmetry of power was concerned. And over the last decade, we built up a very substantial security relationship with the Americans, which included agreements relating to the interoperability of the armed forces, uh, intelligence cooperation, and above all, exercises. So this is how it went. As far as Quad is concerned, Quad was elevated from middle official level to ministerial level as a platform for dialogue and was shaped by the United States at that time in September 2019 as an overtly hostile coalition to China in the West Pacific. South China Sea, the East China East Sea, and the Taiwan Strait. This is the US agenda. My criticism was that India does not need to join an overtly anti-China coalition, and certainly not a coalition that operates in the West Pacific. That is an area outside India's strategic interest. India's interests lie in the is the Indian Ocean that begins from Malacca and ends in the east coast of Africa, where we are already operating. I believe and I have asserted strongly in my writings that I suspect sections of the Chinese security establishment possibly viewed with concern this increasing bonhomie and cooperation between India and the United States and possibly just possibly thought it would be useful to give a gentle reminder to India that we have an undefined, undemarcated border with China all across our land frontier. This is the argument I have made, that I believe that therefore Quad was wrong. Because Quad served no useful purpose whatsoever in helping India handle the problem that was across the border. I believe, and I have said this earlier, India did a degree of course correction. In September 2021, when we had the summit, the security character of the Quad was significantly diluted, and the Quad now applied itself, uh, prioritized uh, to cooperation in regard to the vaccine and the pandemic, climate change and technology cooperation. I think this was a good signal from the Indian side to the Chinese that this misunderstanding that they may have had in Beijing should now be corrected. India has reaffirmed its commitment to strategic autonomy. This became very clear after the Ukraine war started when India informed the Americans very categorically that we were not going to join 
any US-led coalition against Russia. We valued our relations with Russia as a defense partner, energy partner, economic partner, and political partner. At okay. the same time, we also, but we have not given up the relationship with the United States. I said we did court correction by diluting the security character of the court. I believe the same thing has happened with the so-called I2U2. Four very disparate countries have come together. They do not have any shared strategic vision and therefore I do not view it as a strategic uh, alignment whatsoever. If you want to have economic cooperation, technology cooperation, exchange of information and dialogue, so be it. You can put together any set of countries for that. But to pretend that it is a security platform or a strategic coalition is a mistake. So I think that India is, to my mind, actually doing very well. It is hmm. handling its strategic autonomy very well. Americans have been told very categorically where India stands as far as Russia is concerned, as far as China is concerned. If yeah. there was any misunderstanding in Beijing, we have corrected that misunderstanding. And at the same time, slowly but surely, occasions for interaction at <laughs> officials and ministerial level are slowly being pursued. Okay. My own understanding of where Sino-Indian relations should go, I believe they are best served in a broadly multilateral platform. We do have bilateral exchanges, but platforms like the Russia, China, India platform, the RIC, Shanghai Cooperation Organization and BRICS, I believe these are the entities where Indian and Sino-Indian relations are best managed by the two countries, diplomats and political leaders. I think that is what we are doing. We value BRICS, we value SCO, we value uh, the various other interactions that have happened. And where necessary, we make it clear to the Americans that please don't ask us to pick and choose. We are uh, very strongly upholding our commitment to strategic autonomy. You know what, uh, the, the, uh, I think the Indian government is doing good because uh, Imran Khan recently came out and he said that, look at India, if you look his recent speeches, uh, he said, look how India is, uh, you know, behaving like an independent country and we should do this thing. Uh, okay, uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time. So last two questions. Uh, Ray, you have a question. Please go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to ask uh, you about uh, the India-Pakistan uh, relationship and, um, and to what extent uh, the Indian government diplomats, former diplomats uh, like yourself, are uh, engaged in sort of trying to find a solution for the for, for the Kashmir issue because it continues to be, uh, you know, a flashpoint for possible conflicts. I want you to recall that when Prime Minister Modi was sworn in, in 2014, he invited the leaders of SARC and had a very warm engagement with Mr. Nawaz Sharif. Now the point is, and we thought we were going forward with that. And then you had the terrorist attack when uh, you had a large number of our uh, security personnel killed and you had the Balakot and then the retaliatory action. Ask yourself this question. Why is it that every time there is the prospect of better ties between India and Pakistan, initiated by one side or the other, there are very strong action taken by elements within the Pakistani security establishment that ensure that the relationship is set back? I want you to remember once again, uh, go back about 15 years, the interaction that we had during General Musharraf's period between our uh, uh, interlocutors, the Special Envoy from India, Mr. Sati Lamba, and the National Security Advisor of Pakistan, Mr. Tariq Aziz, they moved so far with regard to an agreement with each other. And yet you see in 2007, first you have the assassination of Benazir Bhutto, and within a year you have the attack upon Mumbai. 
the attack upon Mumbai set back the relationship by several years. Then when Mr. Modi comes in, he makes a genuine attempt to reach out to Pakistan. And once again, you find that that Balakot attack sets us back. So there are, now India has made up its mind, it appears to me, that it has now seeped very deep into the domestic scenario in India. Just as bilateral relations between India and Pakistan are a very major factor in Pakistani domestic politics as well. It has now seeped very deep into the Indian domestic pol political scenario as of now. And I am not sure I am looking at any serious attempt by either side to take the relationship forward. From the Pakistani side, we have heard certain pious remarks made by the army chief and one or two other people. But if you ask me very objectively, what I see is a country that is under very serious domestic pressure. You have lost a very strong ally in the, uh, in the detachment of, Pakistan, of the United States. United States no longer views Pakistan as a valued ally. You, Pakistan has become very deeply involved with China. We call them an all-weather uh, all uh, ally. So I think that the conditions in our region are not appropriate, they are not propitious for us to take the relationship forward. Just a few loose remarks of an army chief or about an inter or from an interim prime minister about how we should be, should be building up relations, they are not sufficient. I would say something very serious over here uh, and that is this terrorism by cross-border terrorism has gone long enough. More than 30 years have passed. A lot of damage has been done in India uh, to various sections of our community. It has soured Indian opinion as far as Pakistan is concerned. Pakistan is possibly the only country in the world that uses cross-border terror as an instrument of state policy. This is not acceptable. And if India has such a hardline position today on this subject, it is because we have sustained this kind of assault upon us for far too long. So far I saw that the Pakistani actions were not condemned with the vehemence they deserved because the American side continued to need Pakistan as their ally and supporter in regard to Afghanistan. That era has now gone. Can this become a real basis for change as far as Pakistan is concerned, this calls for A, introspection, B, very real objective assessment by the Pak armed forces as to where their interests lie. For 75 years, the armed forces have ruled the country. Have they have looked after their own interests. I am sure they have not served the interests of Pakistan and of ordinary Pakistanis. I think the, the message must go and through your interview to anybody else who is listening that the era of armed forces dominating domestic politics in a democratic framework is not acceptable. The use of extremist elements as an instrument of state policy is not acceptable. And therefore, I believe if that is understood and accepted on the Pakistani side and we see evidence of real change, you will find India will respond. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, our time is up. I mean, I could go another hour because there are so many questions and uh, Ambassador Ahmed, you know, uh, such an honor that you, you came, you give us the time. Uh, I hope maybe uh, some other day, if you are free, we can you know join again and ask the rest of the questions. Uh, yes, you should give your audience some respite, give a certain uh, break, and <laughs> after some time, when you feel that the audience has recovered sufficiently, uh, I would be very happy to respond positive, positively to your invitation. Sir, uh, I was reading some comments and they were happy that you were here. And thank you very much for your time once again. I know you're very I busy. Uh, uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, thank you very much. I hope thank we will you. see you again next time. Take care My and good pleasure. night. 
all good wishes to you thank, thank you. you bye bye all right folks uh the talmiz ahmed sahab uh first of all ray uh aapke agar koi comment i know wo hum koshish kar rahe the bahut sare sawal jo hai kar le lekin unke paas jo hai kehne ko kafi kuch tha aur hamare paas sawal bhi kab the lekin waqt kam tha muqabla sakh tha to initial response aapka sabse pehle to aapko congratulations on getting um, um, you know such a um knowledgeable and experienced uh bureaucrat on your show um congrats and i think he had did have a lot to say he made a lot of points um i disagree with quite a few things he said um principally and i agree with some of the things he said for example when he talked about cross border terrorism i think that is uh unacceptable i don't think anyone would you know would would argue with that but i did not agree that america was to blame for 911 america you know essentially his point of view was that america you know america's policies led to 911 which gives muslim you know lets muslim fundamentalists and and al qaeda and osama and all these other people completely off the hook so you know um that that i did not agree with um but overall i thought it was interesting you know he is an opinionated gentleman and i'm i'm glad that i was there for it well thank you very much first of all aapka bhi ray sahab kyunki mujhe pata hai ye asal mein humne kal karna tha sunday ko lekin there was a slight mix up wo maine jab unko email likhi thi jab meri se baat ho rahi thi तो मैंने इनको लिखा था कि 3 पी एम मैंने इनको लंदन का बताया 3 पी एम ब्रैकेट में लंदन टाइम तो वो शायद उस ब्रैकेट की वजह से समझे कि मैं शायद लंदन में हूँ और ये तीन बजे जो कह रहे हैं वो इंडिया के तीन बजे तो ही कॉन्टेक्ट भी यस डे सर ओके आई एम वेटिंग एंड आई सर ओके ओप्स तो फिर जब हमने ई मेल चेक की तो, तो उसने कहा ओह यार ये तो थोड़ी सी गड़बड़ हो गई तो अब क्या करें तो इन हर इधन ओके ठीक आ रही है यस सर मुझे आवाज़ ठीक आ रही है लेकिन जब आप बोलते हैं तो ऐसा लगता है बीच में उसके साथ साथ जैसे इफ़ द हेडसेट इज मूविंग स्लाइटली अच्छा अब बताइए अब ठीक है अमीर वी कैन हेयर यू परफेक्टली अमीर ऐसा नहीं कि आपको समझ वो जो वो जो रबिंग हो रही थी अब ठीक है वो हो रही है अभी भी हो रही है इसका मतलब ये फिर इसका मतलब ये कि ये फिर उसके माइक के अंदर कोई है माइक यार वैसे ही है जैसे कल था चले ठीक है लेकिन हम आपको बिल्कुल परफेक्टली समझ सकते हैं ऐसी कोई बात नहीं है आ, आ, आपको मेरी तरफ से स्टैटिक आ रही है अभी भी नहीं आपकी तरफ से तो ठीक है मेरी तरफ से बताइए मैंने माइक को हाथ में इस वक्त पकड़ लिया आ, कोई चैट में बताया क्योंकि मुझे अब मुझे नहीं पता कि आप लोगों को कैसी आ रही मुझे जो जब आप बोलते हैं तो थो, थोड़ा सा एक हल्की सी किड़किड़ होती है हल्की सी अब अब बताइए अब ठीक है यस अब फाइन है ठीक है चले प्लीज कैरी ऑन अच्छा तो मैंने आ, ये आ, दे दिया है चैट पे कम लिंक आ, हम ज़्यादा इसको लंबा नहीं करेंगे अगर आप लोगों में से कोई ज्वाइन करके अपने कमेंट देना चाहता है कोई बात करना चाहता है तो जो है वो आके हमसे बात कर सकते हैं हम लोग यहाँ हैं अगले दस दस पंद्रह मिनट हम बात करेंगे मुख्तु मौजूद में अगर आप चाहें तो आप हमें ज्वाइन कर सकते हैं मैंने लिंक दे दिया आ, उसके बाद ये असल में आज हमारा स्पेशल शो था और वन सेकेंड रे आपका शुक्रिया आप अपने बिजी वक्त से और इस वक्त मेरे ख्याल में वहाँ पर आई डोंट नो काफ़ी I would not say कि सुबह का वक्त है लेकिन वर्किंग डे है और उसमें आप सुबह का ही वक्त है भाई दस बजे हैं अच्छा नहीं यार सुबह हम लोग सुबह छः बजे हो जाती है आप जरा देर से उठते आप जरा जरा लंबे से होते हैं हमें जरा सुबह जल्दी उठने की आदत है यू नो तो तो लेकिन फिर भी वर्किंग डे पे आप आए आपका शुक्रिया तो मैं एक बात मैं एक और बात ही कहना चाहूँगा जो जिन्होंने कल रे का वो प्रोग्राम नहीं देखा जिन्होंने और मैंने भी उसमें शमूलियत इख्तियार की इन्होंने एक बहुत अच्छा शो किया उसके ऊपर एवोल्यूशन के ऊपर तो जिस जिसने वो नहीं देखा प्लीज़ जाके ज़रूर देखें क्योंकि इस तरह का शो मेरे ख्याल में अभी तक नहीं हुआ या मेरी नज़र से कम अज़ कम नहीं गुजरा और उसके अंदर उन्होंने बहुत सिंपल आसान जबान में जो एवोल्यूशन है उसके बारे में बताया तो और आप ये देखेंगे नोट करेंगे कि हमारा जो पोर्टफोलियो इफ यू विल यार ये माय लॉर्ड के नाम से कोई साहब ज्वाइन करने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं आपका डिवाइस कनेक्टेड नहीं है तो मैं आपको नहीं ले सकता सॉरी आप अपना माइक वगैरह चेक करें 
तो हम ये कोशिश करते हैं इसको डाइवर्स रखने की एक तो आपके इंटरेस्ट का है दूसरे हम ज्यादा से ज्यादा लोगों से मुख्तलिफ मौजूद पर बात कर सके अब जैसे मैंने आज इनको दावत दी एंड ही वॉज ग्रेशियस मतलब मैं एक छोटा सा आदमी हूँ आम सा आदमी हूँ एंड ही इज़ अ वेरी फेमिनेंट मतलब प्री एमिनेंट डिप्लोमेट मतलब इन्होंने सऊदी अरब में और बड़े एंड ही हैज कॉन्टेक्ट एंड हाई लेवल्स तो वो आ गए ये उनकी बहुत बहुत मेहरबानी है उनकी कि उन्होंने बिल्कुल और शाह जी देखे सवाल जो थे ना वो इतने ज्यादा ओपन एंडेड भी नहीं थे लेकिन आई थिंक वो हमारा जो मकसद था वो वो भी पूरा हो गया और और उम्मीद है कि वो दोबारा आएंगे बिकॉज यू नो हमारे जो सवाल थे वो मिडल ईस्ट के बारे में भी थे तो काफी 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 एरियाज हमने कवर कर लिए आप उनको दोबारा इनवाइट कीजिए हाँ मैं अभी बहुत सारे सवाल मैं सोच रहा था कि शायद बहुत सारे मैं सवाल कर लूँगा लेकिन चूंकि वो बिजी है तो एक घंटे से ज़्यादा मेरे पास वक्त नहीं था मैं लेना भी नहीं चाह रहा था कि मैं उनको बहुत ज़्यादा एंगेज रखूँ वैसे भी वो एक दिन लेट हो गया था तो कुछ सवाल जी जी प्लीज हाँ वो जो हाँ मैं वही कहने लगा था जो हमारा जो अभी दो तीन सवाल बीच में रह गए थे एक तो वो ये यू वाले पर हमने काफ़ी बात करनी थी इसके ऊपर लेकिन वो ज़्यादा बात हो नहीं सकी क्योंकि मैंने भी ये जब वो बात कर रहे थे तो आई वॉन्ट टू चैलेंज हिम लेकिन मैंने कहा चले वो जरा फिनिश कर ले इन रिस्पेक्ट कि मैं बीच में उनको काटना नहीं चाह रहा था लेकिन साथ साथ मेरी घड़ी भी चल रही थी तो मैंने कहा घड़ी भी चल रही तो क्या करेंगे इसलिए लेकिन अब मैंने सोचा कि अगर मुझे दोबारा मौका मिलता है इनसे बात करने का तो वी विल स्टार्ट डायरेक्टली फ्राम देयर मतलब जो अब ठीक है हिस्ट्री वगैरह का तो हो गया एक चीज दो तीन चीजें जो है ना ये ये मैं कहूँगा ऑन द रेकॉर्ड पहले तो ये जो इंडिया में ये जो मैं ऑफेंड हो गया मेरे मेरे सेंटीमेंट्स जो हैं वो सेंसिटिविटी और ये ये सब फजूल बातें हैं और इनको इनमें कोई भी नहीं जीता सब साइड हारती हैं क्योंकि आपने देखा वो वो नूपुर शर्मा वाली डिस्कशन में मुसलमान हिंदू को के गॉड को वो कह रहा है ये है और वो उसको कह रही है कि तुम्हारा जो है नबी ये था तो ये एक कॉन्वर्सेशन अगर आप, आप लोगों को जो है ना बच्चों की तरह अगर आप ट्रीट करेंगे तो उन्हें उन्होंने बच्चों की तरह ही हरकतें करनी है बजाय इसके कि उनको बच्चों की तरह ओ हो छोटे बच्चे को बुला लग गया ये करने के बजाय आप उनको बोलो कि ग्रो द फक आप ग्रो आप बड़े आप बड़े हो जाएं और ये आपके जज्बात को ठेस पहुंची है भाई हम कुछ नहीं कर सकते जज्बात के ठेस पहुँचने से आज तक किसी की मौत नहीं हुई हाँ लिंच करने से लोगों की मौत हो जाती है ऑलमोस्ट ऑलवाइज ठीक है एक तो ये चीज मैंने कहनी थी ऑन द रिकॉर्ड के दिस इज ये इंडिया की जो मैं कहता हूँ सेक्युलर कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन पे एक बदमा दाग है पाकिस्तान को तो हम क्रिटिसाइज करते ही हैं ठीक है लेकिन ये जो बात है ना इस पे इसका सलूशन ये नहीं है कि सब कुछ चुप करा दो नहीं नहीं भाई हम सब धर्मों की रिस्पेक्ट करेंगे ये नहीं ऐसा नहीं हो सकता ये सस्टेनेबल नहीं है एक फ्री सोसाइटी में आप इनएडवर्टेंटली आप कर दे अब देखें वो काली माँ पे उन्होंने फिल्म बनाई उस वो बैन हो गई वो लाल सिंह चड्डा जो है वो फिल्म बनाई वो उसके ऊपर वो बीजेपी जो है वो हिंदुत्व वाले कैंपेन चला रहे हैं मुसलमानों को के सेंटीमेंट्स हर्ट होते हैं तो वो कहते हैं इसको बैन कर दो उसको बैन कर दो सांस जो है वो दम घुट रहा है लोगों का यार इस तरह नहीं सोसाइटी खुली फ्री सोसाइटी नहीं चलती इस तरह तो यहाँ पर मैं अम्बेसडर साहब के साथ बहुत स्ट्रांगली मैं इख्तलाफ करूँगा कि सेक्युलर डेमोक्रेटिक प्रोग्रेसिव सोसाइटीज जो है वो इस तरह नहीं आगे बढ़ती यही होता रहता है कोई इसके खिलाफ एफ आई आर दर्ज करा देता है कोई इसके खिलाफ दूसरी बात मैं ये करूँगा कि जो कश्मीर में जो इंडियन कश्मीर है जम्मू और यू नो ये कश्मीर की जो साइड है जिसे पाकिस्तान कहते हैं इंडियन ऑक्यूपाइड और वो कहते हैं पाकिस्तान ऑक्यूपाइड ये इसमें एक तो पाकिस्तान को तो हमसे ज्यादा कोई क्रिटिसाइज नहीं करता लेकिन जो बात एम्बेसडर साहब ने नहीं की और अगर दोबारा आएंगे तो मैं उनसे ये जरूर पूछूंगा कि जो आपकी मुस्लिम जो मनोरिटी है उनकी रेडिकलाइजेशन का कौन जो है वो उसकी रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी लेगा अब उनके फीलिंग्स हर्ट ना हो चले ठीक है जी आपने 295 लगा दिया आप कभी नबी के बारे में कुछ भी मत बोले लेकिन उनकी रेडिकलाइजेशन इस्लामिक रेडिकलाइजेशन जो हो रही है मैंने कन्हैया लाल के बारे में भी बात की थी इंडियन कश्मीर जो है इस वक्त गाजा बना हुआ है बिल्कुल गाजा बना हुआ है वेस्ट बैंक बना हुआ है तो इसका क्या करना है इसका 
आपने क्या करना है इसकी गवर्नमेंट के पास क्या सोल्यूशन है जो इंडियन मुस्लिम जो जो रेडिकलाइज हैं जो माइनॉरिटीज हैं जो आ, अपने बेसिकली वो असिमुलेट नहीं हो रही या नहीं होना चाहती हैं जो कुछ भी है इसके इसके बारे में ये, ये बात जो है ना ये बहुत जरूरी है क्योंकि जब तक इंडियन मुस्लिम जो कश्मीर में है वो रेडिकलाइज हैं तब तक ये सोल्यूशन जो है वो ये प्रॉब्लम रहेगी आपने देखा है इंडिया इंडियन कश्मीर में जो मुस्लिम हैं वो इंडियन गवर्नमेंट के खिलाफ है तो इसकी क्या सोल्यूशन है पाकिस्तान उसको खराब और कर रहा है एब्सोल्युटली इसमें कोई शक नहीं है उसका फायदा उठा रहा है लेकिन सोल्यूशन क्या है तो मैं चाहूंगा अगर एम्बेसडर साहब दोबारा आए तो हम सोल्यूशन पे बात करें जी शाह जी थैंक यू अच्छा हमारे साथ एक माई लॉर्ड साहब है इनसे देखते हैं कुछ देर बात करते हैं ये क्या कहना चाहते हैं इस बारे में हेलो 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 I happen to watch the discussion with the ambassador. Uh, I want to talk about uh, Nupur Sharma episode. My I have few comments. Um, firstly, I agree with uh, Ray, uh, Mr. Ray, the protector. What is it? Producer. Okay. Uh, that <clears throat> it the whole uh, episode was motivated because she was a spokesman of. Uh, Uh, BJP. That is uh, one one of my observation. And uh, second thing is, a uh, second thing is uh, one second. I tend to forget. Um. Uh, uh, what is your view, Mister Ray, about uh, the uh, the episode that it was motivated by uh, because she was a BJP? Well, I, I, I think that I, I missed the first part of your question, but I did address this uh, with the ambassador. Um, I think that it is bad. It's poor politics and poor policy to have your spokesperson. Um, I agree uh, that I agree that, but uh, issue, issue. Hold on, issue. You know these these sorts of uh, uh, very. You know, in India, they call this communalism. so anything that might because you know like i said either you either you have across the board um freedom freedom of speech and you know you can say whatever you want about the hindu gods about the muslim gods about well the muslim god but the other one is the prophet in any religion but the problem in india is you have you have it's it's a censored society i'm sorry to say so in that society you can't all of a sudden uh act like oh it's a secular country it's a democratic country well it is democratic but it's not completely secular and it's not completely free and you do have a 295 so for nupur to say well you know that's that's my freedom of speech yes of course it's your freedom of speech and we defend it and we stand by it but freedom of speech in a place like india comes with a lot of consequences unfortunately you saw what happened with the movie on kali Yeah, that got banned this happens every day so and so gets banned so and so gets you know a, a so called fatwa against them there's morchas and demonstrations i had professor wendy donegar on my show she wrote a wonderful book called the hindus that wasn't anti hindu at all that book got banned she was threatened you know so my point is that nupur sharma as much as i disagree with her as much as i think that she's not very uh useful or 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 particularly you know gifted politician had that right to say whatever she wanted to so we have to stand by her right to express her opinion but like i said if if you look at let's look at an american politician or a european politician you know you you that you have certain responsibilities as the official spokesperson and whatever her role was i think she got a little carried away put her foot in her mouth but i think she's been i think she's been punished a little too harshly i think maybe you know a little slap in the wrist t- take her to the side she issues a statement says i'm i'm sorry and she did but but my my point is that muslims uh, have this this exclusive right to be offended and and that is annoying to me uh, i don't think anyone uh, should should have the right to be offended i think everyone should be able to offend and nobody should be offended because we're grown ups and and as long as we continue to treat people like children 
oh, no, don't say anything about their God. Don't say anything about their religion. People are going to keep acting like children. You have to push them to grow up and say, you know what? These are whatever your beliefs are. You know, this is these are mythological characters or whatever it is you believe. Don't force me to believe what you believe. And in India, the solution seems to be nobody talks about religion. And that's fine, too. But then again, like I said, you cannot have a free society where you have these so-called red lines like the ambassador said. There should be no red lines. Nobody has ever been killed because someone made a joke or because someone, you know, had an argument. If someone is killed, it's because someone decided to kill them. Yeah, I Achha, agree. Yeah, Can I have a comment? Yes, go ahead. Please. I agree with you, uh, Ray, that uh, we, our society is still not ready yet for that kind of freedom. Uh, and uh, and uh, the other section easily gets uh, hurt at the stroke of a uh, finger. Uh, okay, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, you're welcome, sir. Uh, Ajesh, how are you? Ajesh, bhai, once again, how are you talking about the topic? Sir, Prasad Shah, it's very good. सब ठीक ठाक ही चल रहा है थोड़ा बिजी था कुछ कामों में लेकिन या थिंग्स आर गोइंग ओके और हेलो टू रे एंड माय लॉर्ड आल्सो क्या नाम उन्हें रखा माय लॉर्ड अब इसको बोलते हुए भी माय लॉर्ड माय लॉर्ड नहीं नहीं ये ये मी लॉर्ड है मी लॉर्ड इंडियन फिल्मों वाले मी लॉर्ड अरे वही मैं भी करता मी लॉर्ड मैंने ये जुर्म नहीं किया आप मुझे सजा ना दे अच्छा खैर थोड़ा सा आप कैरी डोंट वरी डोंट वरी आई एम टॉल राइट तो आई डोंट नो व्हेन डिड यू आपने कब ज्वाइन किया आप कोई कमेंट अगर आप करना चाहे या कोई बात सही रिएक्ट से करी हां हां मैंने मतलब ऑलमोस्ट शायद 5 मिनट लेट ज्वाइन किया था लेकिन हां जो ओवरऑल तो काफी अच्छी डिस्कशन हुई और बाकी मैं आई हैव फुली एंडोर्स व्हाट रे हैज सेड कि वे फ्री सोसाइटी में कोई भी ऐसा किसी को ये कोई राय ये कोई अधिकार तो नहीं होना चाहिए कि वो या आवर फीलिंग्स हर्ट दिस डजंट मेक एनी सेंस और एफली एंडोस विद रे और ये भी है कि रे ने बिल्कुल सही बात पकड़ी है कि जो कश्मीर समस्या भी है इंडिया की अब ये नॉट ओनली कश्मीर अनफॉर्चुनेटली अगर आप थोड़ा हिस्ट्री में जाएंगे हमारे एक प्रेसिडेंशियल कैंडिडेट हुआ करते थे 1992 में द जॉर्ज गिलबर्ट स्वेर ही बेसिकली केम फ्रॉम नॉर्थ ईस्ट और शायद उन्होंने या समबडी ऑफ दैट स्टेचर फ्रॉम नॉर्थ ईस्ट उन्होंने एक स्टेटमेंट दिया था 1990 मतलब आई डोंट नो कब दिया था लेकिन ये हर्ष ने अपने हर्ष मधुसूदन ने अपनी किताब में कोट किया है कि कि जो एफसीपीए है इंडिया का ये जहां हिंदू मेजॉरिटी कम होती है ना वहीं पे लगता है तो इसका दूसरा एंगल ये है कि जहां-जहां हिंदू मेजॉरिटी है इंडिया में वहां पे इंडिया की टेरिटोरियल इंटीग्रिटी को कोई खतरा नहीं है और अनफॉर्चूनेटली जहां-जहां ऐसा नहीं हुआ है I mean, obviously causation is not causal. वो सब वो चीजें हैं अपनी जगह तो ये एक जैसे नॉर्थ ईस्ट हमारा अब थोड़ा पीसफुल है लेकिन एक जमाने में मतलब काफी वायलेंट मतलब एटलीस्ट चार पांच साल से मतलब काफी वायलेंट हुआ करता था इंदिरा गांधी के टाइम पे हमने प्रॉब्लम ओनली टाइम जब इंडियन एयरफोर्स ने थोड़े बम भी गिराए थे नॉर्थ ईस्ट के कुछ एक उसमें तो ये इंडिया में वो रही है अब कश्मीर के बाद तो वही है कि अल्टीमेटली सर एक हमें मालूम नहीं कितना परसेंट लेकिन जो वोकल लोग हैं दे आर रेडिकलाइज कश्मीर वैली में हो uh, सकता है उनकी आबादी कम हो मतलब उनका परसेंटेज वाइज कम हो लेकिन वही हमें दे आर वोकल तो शायद होगा 10 या 20 परसेंट या 30 परसेंट भी हो तो वो मायने रखते हैं बाकी जो 70 परसेंट साइलेंट मेजोरिटी है uh, उनकी नहीं सुनी जाती हमेशा हर जगह ऐसी होता है तो उसमें कोई नई बात नहीं है तो अब इसके लिए तो कोई हमारे पास कोई कोई भाई सबसे हमारा अच्छा अगर मैं होता इंडियन गवर्नमेंट में अगर मैं सलाह दे रहा होता तो भाई आप लोग हैं या जितने हमारे एक्स मुस्लिम भाई लोग हैं इनकी जो बातें हम कि, किस तरीके से पहुंचा सकते हैं कितने फ्रीली ताकि लोग सवाल करना शुरू करें वो शायद हमारे लिए सबसे अच्छा दैट कुड बी दन ऑप्शन बाकी इंडिया की जो मेन प्रॉब्लम रही है कि अनफॉर्चुनेटली जो बहुत चीज़ें हमने सेटल नहीं करी हैं और वो फिर वो घिस्से घिस्से मतलब प्रॉब्लम हो गई हैं जैसे मैं हमेशा बार बार या रिपीट कर रहा हूँ लेकिन फिर भी कहना जरूरी है मतलब आप लोगों को तो पता नहीं फॉर द ऑडियंस कि जैसे 1947 में वंस इंडिया गॉट पार्टीशन राइट फिर अब उसके दो उपाय थे या तो आप एक हिंदू राष्ट्र घोषित कर देते हिंदुस्तान को क्योंकि अल्टीमेटली द पार्टीशन वॉज बेस्ड ऑन द ऑन द रिलीजियस लाइन्स राइट या फिर आपको सेक्युलर करना था और वंस यू गॉट सेक्युलर राइट 
तो फिर आपको करना था कि मतलब या ओके देन इंडिया इज एब्सोल्युटली सेक्युलर राइट तो उसमें जो आपने जो हिंदू कोड बिल हमने जो लाए हैं जिसमें हिंदू नॉट वो कहते हैं हिंदू कोड बिल उसमें लेकिन हिंदुइज्म जैनिज्म सिखिज्म बुद्धिज्म सभी को उन्होंने हमने एक तरह से मतलब पंद्रहवीं से शायद दसवीं शताब्दी से इक्कीसवीं शताब्दी में ला दिया एटलीस्ट एटलीस्ट ऑन द पेपर राइट लेकिन हमने बाकी जो स्पेशली द मुस्लिम लॉ को नहीं ला पाया उस समय मौका अच्छा था क्योंकि मुस्लिम स्टेट पावर इंडिया में उतनी उतनी नहीं थी कंपेयर लेकिन अब वो ये कि पॉलिटिशियंस क्या करते हैं अंबेडकर वाज वेरी एंग्री विद दैट अपसेट विद दैट ये मैटर ऑफ कॉर्डर लेकिन नेहरू ने नहीं किया और नेहरू का आर्गुमेंट वाला सुनने में तो अच्छा लगता है लेकिन अब बहुत बचकाना लगता है आज के जमाने में कि नेहरू ने कहा कि भाई मैं मैं कश्मीरी पंडित मैं एक आई मीन आई एम द फॉरमोस्ट हिंदू लीडर इन द कंट्री बाय पॉपुलेट नो नो डाउट तो मैं चाहता हूँ कि मुस्लिम कम्युनिटी से कोई लोग आए हैं लेकिन ऐसा कभी अनफॉर्चुनेटली हुआ नहीं और वो एक मौका था तो अच्छा एक एक मिनट एक पर होल्ड करें फिर इसको ऐड कर लीजिएगा भाई ये सुपर चैट पढ़ लो वरुण की वो कह रहे हैं uh, Tunis and Sunnis बहुत और जैसे ना कि अब वही बात है कि जैसे अब ब्राह्मण कब ब्राह्मणों को बहुत हम मतलब हमारे यहाँ बस गाली वाली देते हैं इंडिया में भी ब्राह्मणिज्म ब्राह्मणिज्म अब कहीं तक सच्चाई भी तो है उसमें नो डाउट कि भैया जो कंजर्वेटिज्म आया है वो तो ऑब्वियसली लेकिन अब वो भी सच्चाई है ये भी एक सच्चाई है कि जो इंडियन हिंदुइज्म जो है वो है वो दैट इज बिकॉज जो सेव हुआ है मतलब प्रॉब्लम इंडिया इज ओनली सिविलाइजेशन राइट आफ्टर द इस्लाम एंड क्रिश्चनिटी के जहाँ जहाँ गई हैं कि इंडिया स्टिल इज ए मेजोरिटी हिंदू रिलीजन और और इंडिक रिलीजन राइट बाकी रिलीजन तो वो ब्राह्मणिज्म प्लेड अ वेरी बिग रोल तो और एंड देन अगेन आई मीन ओवर ओवरवेलमिंग मेजोरिटी ऑफ द ब्राह्मण्स हैव रिफॉर्म्ड राइट आई मीन अब आपको इंटरनेट में मिल जाएंगे ट्राट टाइप के लोग उनको वो तो खैर नाम भी नहीं लिखते हैं तो आई डोंट टेक दम सीरियसली बट अदरवाइज ओवरवेलमिंग मेजोरिटी ऑफ ब्राह्मणिज्म अगर आप देखेंगे तो सुंदर पिचाई से लेकर सत्य नडेला तक जिसकी तरफ आपकी पॉपुलेशन की एक बहुत बड़ी जो तादाद वो देखती है फॉर गाइडेंस uh, या अपनी रहनुमाई के लिए ये शायद उस सेंस से बात हो रही है कि हमारे जो जो ब्राह्मण्स है वो यूजली दे आर रिस्पेक्टेड बिकॉज ऑफ देयर कास्ट के जी वो ज़्यादा जानते हैं पढ़े लिखे हैं वो अच्छा स्क्रिप्चर को अच्छा जानते हैं तो उसके शायद उस रेफरेंस में लोग कहते हैं कि भाई अगर हम उनको देखते हैं तो ये बजाय उस तरफ जाने के उस एस्पेक्ट के ये पॉलिटिक्स में ज़्यादा जा रहे टू टू यू नो टू गे टू 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 रिमेन इन पावर इफ यू विल और उस उस सिनारी में मैं बिल्कुल उनसे अग्री करता हूँ कि ये शायद उन्होंने अपना मकाम खो दिया है या वो उस तरफ हट गए जो ओरिजिनल में होना चाहिए था वरुण आखिर उनकी दूसरी वर्ष प्रचार वगैरह है भाई इंडिया हिंदू के हिंदू का मलकियत सॉरी हिंदू की मलकियत नहीं है ग्रो अप ये मेरे ख्याल में शायद वो फाल सूट का जवाब दे रहे थे तो जी रे सॉरी मैंने आपको बीच में रोक दिया था नहीं नहीं कोई बात नहीं मैं सुन रहा था देखें सबसे पहले तो एक चीज है कि आ, एंड में जो मजहबी लोग हैं ना वो वो ये जो खास तौर पे जो जो राइट विंग या जो फंडामेंटलिस्ट हैं वो एंड में एक ही हो जाते हैं अब कल परसों हमने स्ट्रीम की थी एवोल्यूशन पर अभी मेरे तरफ से छक छक तो नहीं हो रही ना अभी जब हाँ पहले गायब हो गई थी जब लास्ट टाइम आया था अब दोबारा शुरू हो गई क्या बकवास है यार ये अच्छा चलें अब ठीक है नहीं आप बोले कोई बात नहीं वो अच्छा नहीं है आप सब सुन सकते हैं प्रॉब्लम अच्छा तो आपकी आवाज बड़ी खूबसूरत है उसके बावजूद हमें आपकी आवाज बहुत खूबसूरत लग रही है कि आवाज से ज्यादा कहां खूबसूरत है तो देखें ये मजहबी लोग जो है ना ये ये सब एक पीछे से मिल जाते हैं मिले हुए होते हैं अब आप देखें उस दिन एवोल्यूशन का हमने शो किया उस पे मैंने एक चीज नहीं दिखाई कि वो इस्लामिक वेबसाइट बड़ी मशहूर वेबसाइट है उस पर लिखा हुआ है कि क्रिश्चियंस हमारे दोस्त हैं क्यों इसलिए क्योंकि उनके जो एवोल्यूशन के जो 
कि जो आर्ग्यूमेंट्स है ना हमारी भी वही होनी चाहिए ठीक है इसी तरह जब दंगे हुए थे आ, इंडिया में मतलब 47 से पहले या उस दौरान तो मुसलमान ये जो उस वक्त तो खैर हिंदुत्व ऐसी नहीं थी लेकिन हिंदुत्व तो थी ना आरएसएस भी थी मुसलमान आरएसएस वाले और बहुत से इस किस्म के एलिमेंट्स जो प्रो ब्रिटिश थे उनके खिलाफ थे और ये एक बहुत मशहूर इंसिडेंट है कि पारसियों के जो लिकर स्टोर्स थे उनको जलाया गया उन पर यू नो जो है उनको उनको इंटरमीडिएट किया गया और अब आप देख लें कि पा, इंडिया पाकिस्तान की जो पार्टीशन की स्टोरी उसमें भी जो सेक्युलर लोग थे उनकी कोई नहीं सुनता था एक तरफ जिना खड़ा हुआ था और एक तरफ हमारे गांधी जी थे गांधी जी के मैं बहुत बड़ा फैन हूँ बिकॉज ऑफ हिज नॉन वायलेंस पॉलिसी लेकिन उसका भी आपने देखा नतीजा क्या निकला कि ही वॉज एंट एक्सट्रीम इनफ फॉर दी एक्सट्रीमिस्ट उनको भी आर एस एस के आदमी ने ही असैसनेट कर दिया तो मेरे कहने का मकसद है कि ये नूपुर वाली स्टोरी और हमारे एम्बेसडर साहब ये जो बातें कर रहे हैं ना रैशनल लोग जब तक एक साथ एक आवाज में एक यू you नो know, नहीं बोलेंगे ये मूवमेंट ये जो डेमोक्रेसी है ये एक रैशनल मूवमेंट है और इसको रैशनल लोग ही आगे लेकर जाएंगे जब तक ये इसकी बाग दौड़ मजहबी लोगों के हाथ में है या उन लोगों के हाथ में है जो फ्री स्पीच को सप्रेस करते हैं या कहते हैं नहीं नहीं छोटे बच्चे को बुला लग जाएगा मत बोलो ये चीज बार बार होती रहेगी और सोसाइटी को मचोर करने के लिए आपको छोटे छोटे शौक देने पड़ते हैं और वो शौक्स तभी कामयाब होते हैं जब उसका रिएक्शन वायलेंट नहीं होता एक दफा होगा दो, दूसरी दफा होगा तीसरी दफा लोग बोलेंगे अरे क्या है कोई बात नहीं और जब मैं बड़ा हो रहा था तो हम टीवी पे महाभारता भी देखते थे हमने रामायण के कार्टून भी देखे उनमें भी लोगों ने प्रोटेस्ट किया कि नहीं नहीं आप ये नहीं दिखा सकते वो नहीं दिखा सकते तो मेरा कहने का मकसद ये है कि एंड में ये इंडिया का जो मजहबी मसला है ना ये बहुत पुराना मसला है और हजार साल से ये चल रहा है मैं कहूँगा जो भी सुन रहे हैं जो रैशनल लोग हैं कि भाई बहुत हो गया हिंदू मुस्लिम रैशनल बने और एज इंडियंस एज इंडियंस आगे चले कम्युनलिज्म से निकले कास्ट सिस्टम से निकले से निकले और एज इंडियंस आगे चले वैसे मुझे एक बात का थोड़ा सा हुआ था आई वॉज मैं नहीं कहूँगा कि मैं कुछ और रिस्पेक्ट कर रहा था लेकिन ऑफ कोर्स तलमीज अहमद इज इंडियन वॉज अ डिप्लोमेट तो डिप्लोमेट ऐसा करते हैं वो अक्सर जो है ना वो कॉन्ट्रोवर्सी में नहीं पढ़ते वो कहते अच्छा यार इसको मैं किसी तरीके से जो है सो ही वॉज वेरी गुड फैक्टिंग उसे कहते कि जी हमें इसका नहीं पता वो ठीक है लेकिन आई थिंक यू यू आर राइट के समाइम यू हैव टू टेक अ स्टैंड मैं उनकी बात नहीं कर रहा और वैसे भी उन्होंने कहा था कि मैं तो प्राइवेट सिटीजन हूँ मैं स्कॉलर हूँ तो ही डजेंट केयर अबाउट दैट स्टॉफ एनी मोर वेल वी कैन वी कैन डिसग्री विद हिम और वी कैन मे बी ट्राई टू गेट हिम नेक्स्ट टाइम अच्छा हमारे साथ दाग भी है और ये हमारे आखिरी कॉलर है फिर उसके बाद जो है हम इसका करेंगे नमस्ते नमस्ते जी अस्सलाम वालेकुम सत श्री अकाल सब कुछ बोलना पड़ेगा नहीं तो कोई भी ऑफेंड हो सकता है यहाँ पे हाँ। हमारे हम हमारा काम सबको ऑफेंड करना है आप फिक्र ना करें रोज और पता नहीं यार ये अभी देखिए सबसे बड़ा प्रॉब्लम क्या है ना फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच का कॉन्सेप्ट जो इंडिया में है हम मैं तो इंडिया में रहता हूँ अभी तक क्लियर ही नहीं हुआ हमारा कॉन्सेप्ट ये है कि मैं तेरे बारे में कुछ नहीं बोलूंगा तू भी मेरे बारे में कुछ मत बोल बस चुप रहे यही फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच है तो exactly. ये तो पता नहीं इसका तो कोई मतलब ना सर है ना पैर है और अगर फ्रीडम ऑफ मतलब लोग कह रहे हैं ये नूपुर शर्मा नूपुर शर्मा ने जो किया तो वो तो चलो यार गुस्से में बोल दिया उसने अगर बीजेपी को सचमुच फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच की इतनी चिंता होती तो सबसे पहले आके सलमान रुजदी का जो सैटेनिक वर्सेज है वो अभी भी बैंड है इंडिया में उसको उन्होंने बैन उठाया नहीं अभी तक तो ये किस टाइप का फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच की बात कर रहे हैं मतलब डिप्लोमेट साहब ना बहुत गुडी गुडी खेल के चले गए मतलब <laughs> सच बताओ ही इज टिपिकली टिपिकल ब्यूरोक्रेट जो होते हैं जो किसी से पंगा नहीं लेते लेकिन अपना उन्होंने सब कुछ मतलब आई डोंट वांट टू क्रिटिसाइज हिम और एनीथिंग बट ही वाज नॉट टेकिंग अ स्टैंड ऑन एनीथिंग एक्चुअली ही वाज टेकिंग अ वेरी पॉलिटिकली करेक्ट जो इंडियन पॉलिटिक्स में करेक्ट स्टैंड है एंटी इंपीरियलिस्टिक एंटी यूएस वैसा स्टैंड ले लिया उन्होंने 
उनको बिल्कुल मौका दूंगा अपनी बात रखने का जिस तरह भी वो रखना चाहते हैं हम उनसे डिसग्री कर सकते हैं अभी हम कर रहे हैं कुछ बातों में डिसग्री लेकिन चले अब अब मैं उनसे और तो वो हमारी एक होती है ना फैंटेसी वर्ल्ड जिसमें हम कहते हैं कि शायद वो कुछ स्टैंड लेना कोई दूसरा आदमी वाल दुनिया हमारी विशेष पे नहीं चलती <laughs> और दूसरी बात यह है कि जो हमने देखिए ये जो रे की बात है कि हमारे देश में इंटरनल एक पॉलिटिकल पार्टी अपने स्पोक्स पर्सन को रखेगी या नहीं ये गल्फ कंट्री कैसे डिसाइड कर सकती है सो इट इज एक्चुअली मेडलिंग ही कन्वीनियंटली बोलते ना ही जस्ट bypass that question and yes. started talking about something else it was a very yes. he was not even addressing that ye maine maine do dafa maine do dafa unse ye baat puchi thi aur mera ye ye ek ek genuine sawal hai ki agar main ek bharti shahri hu main ek private citizen hu aur main ek ek kisi position pe hu to kya koi bahar se aake मेरे बॉस को या मेरी पार्टी को या मेरी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन को कह सकता है कि इसको हटा दो तो ये तो डिस्क्रिमिनेशन होती है ना हाँ और अगर 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 गल्फ कंट्रीज के लोग ये नहीं बोलते तो नुपुर शर्मा को अभी तक नहीं हटाया गया होता अभी तक शिव कंटिन्यूड इन हर पोजीशन तो ये तो एक सी ही मतलब डिप्लोमेट साहब खुद मुस्लिम है या प्रैक्टिसिंग है या नहीं है दैट आई डोंट नो बट ही वॉज टेकिंग अ वेरी गुडी गुडी स्टैंड जो कि किसी के लिए अच्छा नहीं है मतलब इट इज नॉट गुड फॉर एनी वन हमारे देश में प्रॉब्लम क्या है ना इंडिया में इंडिया में जो जो रैशनल थॉट वाले लोग थे मोस्ट ऑफ देम गॉट गॉट आइडेंटिफाइड विद द कम्युनिस्ट और कम्युनिज्म इज ऑल्सो टाइप ऑफ डॉगमा मतलब एक टाइप का रिलीजन है तो Absolutely. ये जो दे गॉट मार्जिनलाइज नहीं तो पहले बड़ा ओपनली डिस्कशन होता था और लोग पीपल नेवर यूज टू गेट मीन तब हम सोचते भी नहीं थे कि ये हर्ट भी कोई हो सकता है कि वो आराम से बातें होती थी अब तो पता नहीं आपकी शक्ल पसंद नहीं आई तो आई एम ऑफेंडेड आपने ये क्यों कर दिया आई एम ऑफेंडेड अरे ऑफेंस का तो कोई खत्म ही नहीं होगा ये एग्जैक्टली exactly. तो, यही यही तो मैंने कहा ना कि हम सब ये जो जिसके सब की बातें कर रहे हैं ये हमें इंडियंस जो हैं उनको कह रहे हैं कि भाई मैं तो खैर इंडियन नहीं हूँ अमेरिकन हूँ लेकिन चलो फॉर द सेक ऑफ आर्ग्यूमेंट अगर मैं इंडिया में होता तो आई वुड बी ऑफेंडेड कि आप हमें बच्चों की तरह ट्रीट कर रहे हैं कि हम इतने मच्योर uh, नहीं हैं कि हम बात बर्दाश्त कर सकें और आप खुद सोचें कि, कि कैसी सोसाइटी हो जिसमें सब एक एक दूसरे को बोले नहीं 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 ये मत कहो वो मत कहो ऐसे मत करो ऐसे मत करो दैट इज द डेफिनेशन ऑफ फैशिज्म दैट इज द डेफिनेशन ऑफ टोटालिटेरियनिज्म अच्छा हमारे साथ हमारे आखिरी गेस्ट है चारवा का लोग यार ये अब सॉरी मुझे हेलो, हिंदी हाँ, नहीं आती चारवा मैं चारवा हां हां तो देखिए सी आई थिंक ठीक है ये मींस अरब कंट्री शुड नॉट मेडल आई गेस आई मीन आई अंडरस्टैंड दैट and uh, yeah nupur ko bhi freedom hona chahiye as long as she was giving reference theek hai jo ki kitab mein likha hai but mera uh, actually ek aur point dusra ye bhi hai ki you know there is always a side to hypocrisy yahan pe ab matlab ek particular group ek cheez ke liye to wo ek rational rahega lekin apne side pe aate hi wo ekdam matlab kuch alag ho jata hai salman rushdi ke dono do books banned hai india mein actually when i checked the list okay so one book is of course satanic verses but the other book which salman rushdi is ba- banned is the last sigh of moors ha wo wala aur ye ban hua tha 1995 mein and the reason it was banned was for not offending islam but for talking about bal thakre and shiv sena ha in that book that was aur the reason it was banned charvak main ek aur baat bhi batana chahunga ki rajiv gandhi ne bhi इसको सपोर्ट किया था बिकॉज सलमान रुश्ती वॉज अगेंस्ट इंदिरा गांधीज इमरजेंसी हाँ तो ये ये दोनों तरफ से बिल्कुल सही कह रहे हैं अच्छा एक मिनट ठहर जाए मैं वरुण की एक मिनट एक मिनट मैं वरुण की ये सुपर चैट पढ़ लूँ वो फिर निकल जाएगी रुस्तम पीपल हु कैन अंडरस्टैंड दैट बांदर कैन फ्लाई है खोता पीपल एंड बांदर पीपल बहुत <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah, yeah, that that one one to an extent, yeah, that's true. 
but you know mera mera actually uh, though i don't have anything personal against nupur sharma I, though i disagree with the politics of bjp but to be honest when i talk about bjp right mai re aur rustam ko bata dena chahta they are not essentially against islam in particular though they project themselves against islam but they are actually not they i know what they are against I... is a particular ethnicity wo oh, hai and the reason is uh, aap kuch saal pehle dekhiye ek tejasvi surya naam ke ek mp the jinhone ne badda tweet kiya tha on arab women now that's talking about ethnicity there you are not talking about islam you are talking directly of ethnicity so you know these people mein ek problem ye bhi hai do uh, what i mean if you look at specifically in nupur sharma yes freedom of speech should be there but apart from that the question is they also have a double standard ki bhai agar aap hinduism pe kuch bol do ya un pe kuch bol do to bhai wo to chhed jate hai bhai exactly so you know you know that that's the real problem and one of the more the real problem i do find in the bjp sindhutva politics is ethnic hatred matlab islam ka jis ethnicity se aata hai us ethnicity ko hate karo na ki islam ko do they project themselves as hating islam but you look at the old videos of uh, modi you look at the old videos of narendra modi when he was gujarat cm he categorically states really islam is just like a normal religion religion acha hai religion mein koi burai nahi hai and even in his states that uh, muhammad was also fine but he categorically next says i have problem with muslims community muslims make things bad mere ko usse problem hai uh, you look at this debate in 2001 when he was debating zakaria just before he became uh, chief minister of gujarat in 2001 I have seen that video fully, और ये एन डी टी वी में हुआ था राजदीप सरवे सही आंकर था और जकरिया एंड मोदी डिबेटिंग अच्छा मोदी इंटरव्यू के लिए आया था आमतौर पे तो लगता है मोदी जी वो इंटरव्यू देना भूल गए या वो कोशिश करते कि ना ही दें अनफॉर्चुनेटली यार मेरा जो टाइम है इसका वो खत्म हो गया मैंने इसको ज्यादा लंबा नहीं कर रहा था लेकिन आप सब लोगों की इनपुट का बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया जो जो आए और मैं खास तौर पर वन सेकेंड मैं एम्बेसडर साहब का बेहद मशहूर हूँ कि उन्होंने अपनी कीमती वक्त से निकाला और मुझे वक्त दिया आई एम रियली थैंकफुल टू हिम ठीक है वो वो उस वो उस वो, डायरेक्शन में जाएंगे नहीं नहीं जाएंगे नहीं नहीं एक और वजह भी थी मैंने जब उनको भेजा था उन्होंने मुझसे पूछा टॉपिक क्या तो मेरा ख्याल है मैं उसको मैंने बहुत ज्यादा ब्रॉड नहीं रखा था तो वो ज्यादातर जो है वो उस पे भी था आ, आ, और वो उनका और उनका एरिया भी नहीं है चार नहीं है हाँ, हाँ, तो हाँ. मैं 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 नहीं चाहता था कि मैं फिर इसलिए मैं बीच में ज़्यादा मैंने इंटरफेयर नहीं किया क्योंकि मैं मुझे पता था कि वो एक तो वो जो हमारी जो होती है ना पहले से एग्रीमेंट होता है कई दफ़ा कि जी अच्छा इतना ब्रॉड वो बोल सकते हैं इतनी उनके पास नॉलेज है मेरे पास भी बहुत सारे सवाल है तो अब मैं अगर उससे सवाल कर रहा हूँ और टाइम मेरे पास कम था मेरे पास एक घंटे का वक्त था तो मुझे उसमें अंदर से बहुत सारे सवाल जो है स्किप करने पड़े तो मैं कोशिश करूंगा उनसे नेक्स्ट टाइम जब बात करूँ तो मैं उसमें इन चीज़ों को ऐड कर लूँ एक चीज बता ये फोटोग्राफ आपकी है ये रुस्तम जी सर आपको क्या लगता है जबरदस्त नहीं आई एम वेरी ऑफेंड आई एम वेरी ऑफेंडेड एंड आई एम वेरी जेलस यू आर सो गुड लुकिंग एंड आई गॉट ऑफेंडेड एक्चुअली अब इस पर अच्छा यू शुड कवर योर फेस एंड यू नो एवरीथिंग हां भाई हमारा हमारा काम ही लोगों को ऑफेंड करना है हम तो अच्छा खासा लोगों को ऑफेंड कर रहे हैं यार ये ये तो वो वाली बात हो गई ना निकलो ना बेनकाब जमाना खराब है जमाना खराब है अरे यू नो यू नो लेट मी लेट मी टेल वन मोर थिंग रुस्तम दैट I think you can have an extended lives uh, weekly once or twice. Maybe आप दो तीन घंटे आराम से कर सकते हैं, I guess. जैसे आप बिल्कुल मैं that will be better I feel. Yeah yeah no मैं हमेशा मेरे जो shows होते हैं वो दो से तीन घंटे के ही होते हैं. लेकिन ये असल में जैसे मैंने कहा ना ये हमने कल करना था कल संडे वाले दिन कल हो नहीं सका वो कुछ mix up हो गया था वो timing का मसला हो गया तो आज हमें जो है ना वो आज plan नहीं था. तो इस वजह से जो है मैं नहीं कर सका वो कह रहे हैं कैपलर या कैपलर कह रहे हैं रुस्तम इज लुकिंग सो यंग एट दिस एज व्हाट डू यू मीन बाय दिस एज 
अभी तो हम चबा अरे यार भाई। वो आपको वो समझ गए कि उनको लगता है कि आपने जो टीपी लगा है वही आपका असली चेहरा वन आई कैन से ये uh, अच्छे वक्त तो की आप तस्वीर वैसे मैं इसको मैंने लास्ट टाइम भी कहा था मैं आखिरी दफा फिर कह रहा हूँ कि आई कैन नॉट कन्फर्म नोट डिनाई कि ये मेरी तस्वीर है कि मैं जानबूझ के वेग रखता हूँ क्योंकि Uh, मेरे ख्याल में ये अच्छी पॉलिसी है खैर एनी anyway, uh, मैं वन सेकेंड तमाम लोगों के शुक्रिया के साथ uh, uh, आप लोग आए uh, और आपने वक्त दिया yeah. आपने सुना तो आई होप कि जब नेक्स्ट टाइम हम एम्बेसडर uh, साहब से बात करें uh, उनको बुलाएंगे और वो अगर हम वक्त देते तो फिर जो बाकी जो कुछ सवाल रह गए थे हम um, उसके बारे में yeah. उनसे बात करेंगे तो uh, आप लोग अगर... शाहजी एक सेकेंड आप लोग कॉमेंट्स में भी ना अभी कॉमेंट्स में जाने से पहले अपने क्वेश्चन डाल दें तो नेक्स्ट टाइम yes. चांस मिलेगा तो हम उनसे पूछ लेंगे या एक काम हाँ प्लीज जितने यहाँ बैठे हुए प्लीज भाई आप उस पर ना कोई कमेंट कर दिया करें वीडियो के ऊपर क्योंकि उससे मैंने ये नोट किया कि उसका भी फर्क पड़ता है वीडियो की एक्सेसिबिलिटी पे जितना आप लाइक करते हैं उसके अलावा अगर आप कॉमेंट करें ना तो वो वीडियोज भी सर्च में ऊपर आती है क्योंकि लोग उसको देख रहे होते हैं तो प्लीज उसमें जो भी आपके कॉमेंट है सजेशन है जो भी आप देना चाहते हैं अगर आप यहाँ लाइव नहीं कर सके तो दो मिनट लगेंगे इस वीडियो को जब खत्म हो आप यूट्यूब को रिफ्रेश करके उस पर कॉमेंट करके और प्लीज़ मुझे अपने फीडबैक से ज़रूर आगाह कीजिए क्योंकि उससे मुझे काफ़ी हेल्प मिलती है नेक्स्ट टाइम जब मैं शो करना होता है ठीक है तो थैंक यू वेरी मच वन सेकेंड आई विल सी यू ऑल नेक्स्ट टाइम टेक गुड केयर ऑफ शेयर थैंक यू शारी थैंक यू ऑल